I'm uh, Reverend Angus Stewart of the Covenant Protestant Reformed Church in Ballymena, Northern Ireland. I'm joined here by Professor David Engelsma, Emeritus Professor of Dogmatics of the Protestant Reformed Seminary. And we are in the main auditorium of the British Reformed Fellowship Family Conference in 2012 in County Down, Northern Ireland. And we're here to talk about Professor Engelsma's most recent RFPA book, Reformed Free Publishing Association book. I've stated that carefully because your most recent book is actually the Reformed Worldview, which was published by the BRF. So, Professor Engelsma, let's start with the basics. What is this federal vision? Federal vision is a theology of salvation with particular reference to the covenant of grace and then more specifically with regard to the salvation of baptized children of believers. This theology is a heretical theology appearing in the most reputedly conservative Reformed and Presbyterian churches in North America. And it teaches that with regard to the baptized children of believing parents, all without exception are at baptism, if not by the administration of the sacrament of baptism itself, united alike to Jesus Christ, so that all of the baptized children, without exception, receive, begin to receive, the salvation that is in Jesus Christ, and the most outstanding benefits of the salvation that is in Jesus Christ, including justification. The heresy of the theology is indicated already in that it obviously denies that salvation in the covenant is rooted in and governed by God's decree of eternal predestination. Specifically, salvation in the covenant is divorced from the decree of election. And the necessary outworking of that heretical theology is the blatant teaching of the theologians of the federal vision that although all the children are united to Christ and begin to receive Christ's salvation, whether these children continue to be united to Christ and to receive his salvation and finally to enjoy the perfection of that salvation depends upon conditions that they must perform. And the conditions are faith, and lifelong obedience of faith. Many children fail to perform those conditions and are therefore separated from Christ, lose the salvation that they have begun to enjoy and go lost everlastingly. In, in brief, it is a theology that cuts covenant salvation loose from election and therefore make salvation in the covenant conditional. It is a theology of conditional salvation. What would you say to those who would charge you with equating the covenant and election? My response to that accusation is that the accusation is a deliberate falsification of the issue. There is nobody with any reform sense whatsoever who has ever identified election and the covenant. Election is an eternal decree according to scripture, the Westminster Confession, and the canons of the Synod of Dort. The covenant is a relationship that God establishes with his people in Jesus Christ in time and in history. What the accusation masks and is intended to say is that uh, we teach or I teach that 
the covenant and its salvation are governed by election. That's different from teaching that election and the covenant are one and the same. Now, your book is subtitled Heresy at the Root. You're charging that federal vision is heresy. And then secondly, you're aiming to attack it at the root, which I assume is the idea with this cover. There are some plants here and you're coming with the weed killer, as it were, not only to kill the top bit, but to kill the roots so that it is wiped out. What do you mean by heresy at the root? What is the root? The subtitle of the book, as you have pointed out, Reverend Stewart, is Heresy at the Root. One of the fruits of the theology of the Federal Vision is the denial of justification by faith alone. The Federal Vision teaches and teaches openly that justification is by faith and by the good works that faith performs. And therefore, the Federal Vision is the radical overthrow of the 16th century reformation of the church and also the denial of the heart of the gospel of grace which is as Paul teaches in Romans 3 verse 28 that the sinner is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. There are some churches and some theologians who oppose the federal vision with reference to the teaching of the federal vision that justification is by faith and by works. And my charge in the book is that that is a defense of the faith over against the federal vision with regard merely, and I don't mean by merely to minimize justification by faith alone, but to indicate that uh, that defense of the faith deals only with certain fruits and symptoms of the theology of the federal vision. Some oppose the federal vision by uh, affirming justification by faith alone and condemning the federal vision doctrine of justification by faith and by works. But my charge is that all of that defense of the faith and opposition to the federal vision deal only with the fruit of the theology and never gets at the root of the heresy. And I make the comparison in the book with a doctor that might treat a cancer patient and content himself with cutting off certain cancerous lumps on the surface of the body while neglecting or deliberately refusing to get at the root of the cancer deep within the body. Nothing has been accomplished really by cutting off some of the excrescences of the cancer in the body. Any medical doctor worth his salt will attempt to eradicate the source and the cause of the cancer. That's what those churches and theologians are doing who are contenting themselves only with repudiating the federal vision doctrine of justification by faith and works. The source and root of the heresy of the federal vision is its doctrine of the covenant of grace. And it is inexcusable that a church or a theologian refuses to address that fundamental doctrine when the theologian or the church is dealing with the federal vision for the federal vision has named itself federal vision and federal is derived from the Latin term fetus, F-O-E-D-U-S, which means covenant. The men of the federal vision identify their theology as a covenant theology. And the theology of the covenant that the federal vision is developing, hasn't invented it, but is developing, is the teaching that God's covenant and God's covenant salvation, especially of the children of believers, 
do not have their root in God's election so that the covenant and covenant salvation are conditional. To say it just a little differently, the root of the federal vision is the doctrine that the covenant and its salvation of the children of believers are conditional. That is, the covenant salvation of the children of believers, according to the federal vision, depends not upon God's election or upon the limited atonement of Christ or upon God's irresistible grace working in some of the children of believing parents, not at all, but the salvation of the baptized children of believing parents, rather according to the federal vision, depends upon works, conditions that the child must perform. Faith then is regarded as a condition performed by the child upon which the child's salvation depends and the lifelong obedience of the child, which is also supposedly a condition of salvation, uh, that covenant obedience is not the fruit of the grace of God in the child, but rather a work that the child performs and must perform upon which his salvation depends. The federal vision at its root, therefore, is a theology of covenant salvation by man's works. And that, that root is heretical. That's the thrust of the book. Not just some fruits that uh, it produces, but the root of it is heretical. Now, the book itself consists of two parts. The first part explains <clears throat> the federal vision and explains why it's wrong and must be eradicated. And the second part deals with answers to questions. As I understand it, this book arose out of a lecture first given in Crete, Illinois. Is that correct? It was given once in Crete, but I think the lecture was given originally as a Reformation Day lecture in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Grand Rapids. Later in Crete. And Later in Crete. Places I and used. I think I gave it also in Northwest Iowa, I'm sure I did, and perhaps also in Randolph, Wisconsin. I gave a lecture four times, as I recall. And then Crete Protestant Reformed Church especially decided to publish this in the form of a book, and then it was later taken over by the RFPA. I'm not clear on those details. That could very well be the case. In the end, it was published by the RFPA. Yes, the Reform Free Publishing Association. Yes, I think they've done a very nice job, too. And uh, this book is available in hardback from the Covenant Protestant Reformed Church for eight pounds. Not often you get a hardback book for eight pounds. But we're not finished with you yet, Professor. I want to ask you about a statement you've made in this book and elsewhere that the federal vision is the main threat to the Reformed faith in the world today since Dort. Is that not unduly alarmist? Are you not going over the top there? I don't personally feel this, you understand, but I'm, I'm reproducing some of the criticisms or charges. That has been uh, an observation, if not a charge, on the part of some. I was deliberate when I lodged the accusation and have considered the charge in the light of criticism of it that some have made, and I stand by that charge. And my motive in uh, saying what I did, making the charge that I did against the Federal Vision, was not to get attention to the book, but was to get the attention of especially the members of conservative, Presbyterian, and Reformed churches, where this doctrine of the federal vision, if not in its fruits, then in its root, is being taught every Lord's Day by the ministers and whose seminaries contain professors who are also teaching this heresy. We live in days when it's difficult to get the attention of 
reformed people concerning grave threats to their churches and to the salvation of their generations. So the admittedly strong statement had that practical purpose in mind. I believe that the charge is accurate and I believe that the charge that this is the most serious threat to the gospel of grace since Dort is legitimate for the following reasons. In the first place, obviously it is a theology that destroys all of the essential aspects of the truth of the gospel of grace, specifically as outlined and defined by the Synod of Dort. The Federal Vision denies justification by faith alone, which Luther said, and I agree with Luther, because he said it on the basis of Paul's teaching, especially in Romans and Galatians, that justification by faith alone is the heart of the gospel of grace, so that if that doctrine is corrupted or lost, the entire gospel of grace is thereby necessarily forfeit. And John Calvin agreed with Luther on that, as everyone can read for himself or herself, by reading Calvin's treatment of justification in the Institutes. Calvin called the truth of justification by faith alone the, the cornerstone of the gospel. That doctrine is in peril today, and that is one reason why this is such a grave threat. But with the, the denial of justification by faith alone, the Federal Vision denies eternal unconditional predestination with regard to salvation in the covenant. It denies limited atonement. It openly teaches that Jesus Christ died for all. And some of the spokesmen, the main spokesmen of the Federal Vision, including Norman Shepherd, who in a way is the father of the Federal Vision, as it has appeared in conservative churches in North America, Norman Shepherd has criticized the reformed understanding of John 3, verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, in as much as the reformed explanation of the death of Christ, the extent of the death of Christ, limits that extent by the decree of election. And Shepherd has written that the reformed preacher may say to every human being, Christ died for you. That's a denial of the fundamental truth of an efficacious atonement of Jesus Christ for the elect of the human race and the elect alone. Federal Vision denies also irresistible grace, obviously, if God begins the work of salvation in some children, but those children are able to lose that salvation and perish outside of Christ. The grace of God in the covenant is not sovereign and irresistible. And the Federal Vision openly denies, seems to take special delight in denying the perseverance of the saints. It's forever warning every member of the church till the day he dies, including me and including you, who believes in Jesus Christ, that it's possible for us, if we cease fulfilling the conditions, to be separated from Christ, to lose our salvation, and to perish everlastingly. A dreadful doctrine pointing out that every theology of conditional salvation implies and carries with it the uh, devastating notion that we must live in the terror of falling away and perishing even though we are saved today. So that's one reason why I accuse this theology of being the gravest threat to the Reformed faith, to the gospel of grace since the time of Dort. The second reason for this strong statement, this charge against the Federal Vision, is that it is being taught widely in 
some of the most reputedly conservative and orthodox seminaries and churches in North America. And therefore, it comes on the wings of uh, theologians and seminaries and churches that uh, accredit it as sound and acceptable and tolerable at the very least. And I name names in the book of seminaries and theologians who have a high reputation for orthodoxy and are very influential among the most conservative of Reformed and Presbyterian church members. This makes it a very deceptive and dangerous teaching. And then in the third place, and this is probably if I had to distinguish the main reason why I think it legitimate to charge the Federal Vision with being the most dangerous attack on the Gospel since Dort is exactly the root of the heresy. It comes out of the doctrine of a conditional covenant, a covenant that is not governed by God's election. And that doctrine of the covenant has over the years become probably the most popular doctrine of the covenant throughout Reformed and Presbyterian Christendom. The Protestant Reformed churches, of which I am a member, have objected to that covenant doctrine and condemned it long, long ago, really at the beginning of our separate existence as churches in the early 1920s, but then explicitly in the early 1950s. But otherwise, many Reformed churches and Presbyterian churches teach that the covenant is divorced from election and that the covenant is conditional. It depends upon the works that especially the baptized children perform. Since the churches and theologians are committed to that covenant doctrine, out of which these other heretical teachings flow, the churches are susceptible to the full-fledged heresy of the federal vision. It has an entry point into the most conservative, reformed, and Presbyterian churches. And that, to my mind, makes it the most dangerous, the gravest threat to the Reformed faith, to the gospel of sovereign grace, as uncovered again at the Reformation and defended by Dort, that we have seen since 1618 and 1619. That's a pretty solid argument to my mind. Professor, in your last response you talked about naming names. Norman Shepard, Steve Schlissel, Doug Wilson, Peter Lilbeck, amongst others are mentioned in the Federal Vision. You've named institutions, Westminster Seminary for one. You've named denominations, the Presbyterian Church in America, PCA, and the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in the States. What of those who say Engelsma is painting with too broad a brush? He's criticizing severely a lot of organizations, people, instituted institutions, churches, denominations. Has he perhaps overreached himself? And who is he to be attacking so many and such stalwart churches and individuals? How, how would you respond to that? When an objector to my naming names would say, who is he and who does he think he is that he dares to name these prestigious institutions and these popular, powerful theologians, I feel the, the weight of that accusation. I'm a nobody in comparison with them. But it is a penchant of our Lord God to use the nobodies in order to call account into account those who are somebodies. They said about Martin Luther, for example, a, barber, a, a 
a, a lowly monk in barbarous Germany. Who is he to tackle the great university in France and uh, the whole papal establishment in Rome and the other theologians with many degrees and high-flying reputations who were defending the doctrine and theology of the Roman Catholic Church. The question is not who is, but the question is not who is lodging the accusation. The, the question for the people of God in the Reformed churches today should rather be, is the charge true? Is it demonstrated? And I demonstrate the truth of the charge by numerous quotations citing book chapter and verse, and then expose the teaching in the light of the Reformed Confessions, which bind all of us, and which we regard as the orthodox summary of the Gospel of Grace, and in the light of Holy Scripture. I regard it as uh, cowardly today that men who do in fact recognize the grievous heresy of the federal vision and will say something now and then in a general way usually about the error of the federal vision refuse to name names. I don't regard it as uh, audacious to mention the names of the false teachers and of the institutions that have approved or spawned this heresy. I regard it as the duty of anyone whom God has placed as a watchman on the walls of Zion. The people of God must know where these false doctrines are originating and who are supporting and promoting and defending these doctrines. I would regard it as negligence if I didn't in the course of a critique of the federal vision mentioned those who are teaching it. And those who are teaching it are very prominent, influential men. Peter Lilbach is president of Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. Norman Shepard was for 16 years professor of theology at Westminster for seven years, the faculty and the board and even a powerful presbytery in Philadelphia examined his teachings and were not able to condemn even the fruits of his teaching, but exonerated him and unleashed him upon the conservative Presbyterian world in North America to spread this doctrine. And uh, they must be held to account and the members of their churches who believe the gospel of grace and feel themselves called to confess it and stand for it must know that their own leaders and their own churches are guilty of promoting this doctrine. And with regard to the denominations, the Presbyterian Church in America has recently exonerated the teachings of the Federal Vision and exonerated the, those who were brought to trial for teaching the Federal Vision so that the Presbyterian Church in America is on record at some of the highest or broadest ecclesiastical assemblies as approving of the doctrine which makes the entire denomination responsible for it as well finally as every member in the denomination and the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in addition to the refusal by the Philadelphia Presbytery to condemn Norman Shepard and his teaching of the Federal Vision later approved uh, a teacher of the Federal Vision and his doctrine of the Federal Vision at their General Assembly, which is the broadest assembly involving the entire denomination of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. 
that makes those churches uh, guilty of approval of the doctrine. And there's nothing doubtful about a charge that these churches, therefore, are responsible for promoting it and approving it. Now, some individuals, office bearers, presbyteries, have done some things against the federal vision and the OPC and the PCA. Uh, don't if you feel that that's too little, I hope that it's not too late. But would you deny that there are men seeking to oppose this movement and even groups of men, or ministers or, or presbyteries? And what should we say regarding their neighbors? I have no doubt but that there are ministers and elders in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church who oppose the federal vision, but their general assembly has refused to condemn it and has approved it, and denominational membership includes the responsibility for the decisions that the denomination takes in its official assemblies. And then one minister may say, I don't agree with the decision that the General Assembly took, but by being a member of that denomination, he stands responsible for that decision just the same and will suffer the consequences of that decision as the heresy spreads effectually throughout all the, uh, the body. I resort once more to the example of a cancer, which is a biblical exam uh, example. Canker or cancer in the body of the church. A body in which there is cancer might have, let us say, a toe that says, I don't like that cancer, I oppose to that cancer. But if the surgeon is not getting the cancer out of the body, the toe will die along with all the other organs in the body. Okay, so if we um, accept this, uh, are we hypothetically here, you see, and agree that yes, we should name names as the Lord did, and Jeremiah and the Apostle Paul. What then of the charge concerning the odium theologicum? Why does Professor Engelsma, especially in this book, Federal Vision, Heresy at the Root, use strong polemics. If he were more gentle, someone could argue, he might be able to win more people to his cause if he wrote, let's say, more in the style of a Guy Prentice Waters. Might he be more persuasive? How would you respond to that? Basically, I would respond to that criticism that Serious diseases call for strong medicines. This is a serious disease. As serious as the Arminian heresy, of which this is a form, that's all it is, it's a form of the fundamental Arminian heresy, that salvation is not rooted and grounded and made certain in and by God's eternal election of grace, but is rather the highly uncertain matter that depends upon man, just as at the time of the Synod of Dort, the champions of Reformed Orthodoxy used strong language against the Arminian heresy, and in part, first of all, the strong condemnation was true, but they were motivated also by the necessity to alert the Reformed people who were being deceived as to how serious this issue was. And therefore, in the canons of Dort, the fathers of Dort described the Arminian heresy as the doctrine of Pelagius out of hell. I don't use language that strong, I don't think, although that applies to the federal vision. That is what it is. But my hope is that by 
this strong condemnation. The people of God who are in many churches sitting back and allowing the federal vision to be taught and to be approved by their ecclesiastical assemblies will raise their voices in protest against their minister if he's culpable or against the general assembly if it has approved a teacher of the federal vision and failing to turn their churches around separate themselves from those apostatizing institutions for the sake of their own salvation and for the sake of the salvation of their children and grandchildren. I don't think we should forget that particularly now with regard to the federal vision teaching of justification by faith and by works, those who are converted to the federal vision theology and practice the federal vision theology will be damned. All who appear in the judgment of God, depending for their righteousness and their salvation upon something they have done, upon some work they have performed, or a condition they have fulfilled, will be condemned according to Scripture. Only those today who seek justification by faith in Christ alone on the basis only of Christ's work for them and outside of them, only those are forgiven and justified. And that's the way it will be in the final judgment as well. So salvation is at stake here. God's people and their children are saved by the teaching, the preaching, of justification by faith alone and by the gospel of salvation by grace alone. And to corrupt that gospel is to send many to hell. Yeah. And if the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Spirit, could anathematize the false gospel and the false gospelers in Galatians 1, what in all the world would be wrong with somebody echoing Scripture? Are doing that to the people doing exactly the same thing today. You convinced me, but I didn't need much convincing. <laughs> there is this too with regard to the charge that the language is too strong. That ours is a very superficial ecclesiastical and religious time. Toleration is the order of the day. And many ministers have convinced their people that Christian love means that you tolerate error or at least speak softly concerning error and errorists. And this kind of language in the federal vision that, so to speak, calls a spade a spade easily strikes people as being hateful. Now, in fact, that strong language is not hateful. It's language of love for God, language of love for His truth, and language of love for the people of God who are in peril. If there's a firebug igniting a building, I am not an unloving bigot because I scream fire at the top of my voice and name the arsonist who is responsible for the fire. It seems to me that much of the modern thinking about love in the Christian church is the politically correct notion of niceness that ungodly states and secularists have been promoting as Christian love for decades and now people are beginning to believe it. I think that's what's happening. And you pointed out the strong language used by Jesus Christ used by the Apostle Paul. And then you could add, and I mentioned the strong language that the canons of Dort used. We could also add to that the strong language used by the men whom God used to be the great defenders of the faith in the history of the church. 
the language of a Martin Luther or the language of a John Kelvin in the institutes. But our age is unfamiliar with that. that our age is to a large extent unfamiliar with any condemnation of error, even in the softest of terms. Ministers pride themselves that they're going to be positive and only positive. And the popular preachers are the ones with the most white teeth and the biggest smiles with regard to everything. Professor, thank you for, for your time and for Cassandra for recording this. Get a hold of Federal Vision, Heresy at the Root. Read it, reread it, and stand strong. Thank you.